perfection. Difficult word, kind of scary. I've started out with definitions here. I think it's very important to define our terms. So definition of sin, definition one, sinful nature, definition two, sinful character. It's a huge difference in what you believe, whether it's the nature you inherit or the character you develop. Once you have decided what sin, decided what sin is, you have automatically decided what sinlessness is and when it will occur. If you believe that sin is definition one, sinful nature, then sinlessness will be definition one, sinless nature, and that will not happen until Jesus comes. However, if you believe definition two, that sin is the character we develop by our choices, then sinlessness is going to be the character we develop by our choices and by the Holy Spirit's power, and that can happen before the second coming of Christ. So it's a huge issue to decide what sin is. Now, if you look at section C, perfection, there are four different meanings for that one word, and that's why it's a little bit confusing. We start out with absolute perfection. Absolute perfection. Who has it? Only God, my friends. Only God has absolute perfection. Because no one with a finite mind can get it right the first time always, not even angels. 4,000 years into the great plan of redemption, they still had some sympathy for Satan, didn't they? And that was only removed at the cross. So limited finite knowledge cannot be absolutely perfect ever. Only God with His infinite knowledge is absolutely perfect. So if anybody asks you the question, can we be absolutely perfect? And you can smile and say not for a couple of million years at least. <laughs> nature perfection, number two. At birth, we receive a sinful nature. At the second coming, we will receive a sinless nature, which is nature perfection. And if you'll notice, there is no human decision involved in any of that. Nothing about what you receive at birth, nothing about what you're going to receive at the second coming. That's God's business. So nature perfection, the second definition of the word, has nothing to do with us today. It is not an issue that we need to be concerned with. And so we go to definition three, character surrender. When you come to Jesus Christ, how much of your life do you give over to him? All. All of what? All of what you know at that particular point in your life's experience. Isn't that right? And at the beginning, it isn't much, is it? Now, definition three, character surrender, is the only requirement for salvation now or ever. God is not going to ask you the question, how long have you been a Christian? How mature have you become? How much education do you have? He's only going to ask you one question. Do you love me with all your heart? That's all God wants to know. Do you love me with all your heart? Now, how can I be so dogmatically sure that this is the only requirement for salvation? Because I read a story in the Bible about a thief on a cross who had very little time to mature, who had very little knowledge of the great controversy, but he saw that he was a sinner, deservedly so, and there was a Savior right next to him who could deliver him for eternity. That took faith, didn't it? Huge faith to believe that. And Jesus said, there are very few that we know will be in heaven. Isn't that right? We know that thief will be with Jesus in heaven. Definition three, the only requirement for salvation. Now, if definition three is working correctly, where is it going to lead? Are we going to be stagnant or are we going to be growing? That little circle of surrender is going to be growing and growing and growing as God reveals more things to us of his will and will gladly participate in it. You see, God doesn't leave us alone with, well, do you love me? No, he asks specific questions. Do you love me with your time? And that's why he's given us a special day out of every week as a token that all of our time belongs to him. And if we'll give one-seventh back to him, that is our token that we understand that he is our creator. Do you love me with your money? And again, there's a token there, isn't there, that all of our money belongs to him with that sacred tenth being placed in his hands first. Do you love me with the food you put on your plate? Yes, he asked that too. Do you love me with what you see with your eyes, what you hear with your ears? 
do you love me with all your heart? He keeps asking specific questions, doesn't he? And as we say, yes, Lord, that circle of surrender grows and grows and grows. So, definitions three and four are the only definitions of perfection that apply to us today. Complete surrender, now, every day, leading to complete maturity. Is that so scary? That's as natural as a little plant growing up, is that right? Little plant grows up, has three leaves on it, you want tomatoes out of it, it's only got three leaves. Can it do any better at that point in its experience? It's perfect in its sphere at that point. Perfectly developed at that point. But it's got to keep growing. It's got to keep growing and becoming a full fruit-bearing plant. So character surrender today is what we focus on, folks. The maturity will come if we keep focusing on the surrender. If you're running a race and there's a finish line over at the other end of the stadium, where should your focus be at every point during that race? Watching that finish line over there? No. Watching the three feet in front of you. And if you keep on watching the three feet in front of you, where will you end up? Over on the other side at the finish line. Focus on surrender. Focus on surrender. And so this last part of the little diagram here. We are guilty because of our sinful choices. Perfection, the only parts that matter to us today is a series of sinless choices. Don't be frightened by that word. It's a sinless choice to accept Jesus as your Savior. That's character surrender leading to character maturity, and human decision is involved in every step of that process. That's what perfection is about for us today. Now this morning, we're just going to take a quick look at some Bible texts. I'm going to ask one question, and you'll have to answer it for yourself. Does the Bible teach, and you can name it what you want, character perfection, character maturity, sinless character? Does the Bible teach it? And we're going to look at some texts together. Start with me in Jude, verse 24. All of the texts we are going to read this morning are promises. There are many commands in the Bible. We are not going to read any commands today. We are just going to read promises. Here's the first one, Jude, verse 24. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Is that a promise? What a marvelous promise that is. Let's keep going. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. And I'm focusing here on the first half of this verse. Another promise that we can take to heaven's bank. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations. Can he do that? If we haven't been, if we've been delivered from a temptation, we haven't fallen under that temptation. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 13, what a marvelous promise this one is. In fact, there are three promises in one verse. It starts out with a simple statement, which is a promise. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You're not special, you're not different, everyone's in the same boat together. Take heart. But God is faithful, who will not suffer, that means allow, you to be tempted above that ye are able. Is that a promise? And then, finally, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. With every temptation that Satan is allowed to bring to us, there is a way of escape. So can't we just abandon the question, is perfection possible, and instead ask the question, what's the way of escape? Shouldn't we focus all of our attention on that? What is the way of escape when a temptation comes to me? So, right for a few minutes here, I'm going to drop the theology, and we're going to talk about very, very practical issues. And I'm going to do it by a statement from Ellen White that is not in your outline. I'm going to go through it very carefully with you. It starts out with her words by this. If Satan seeks to 
divert the mind to low and sensual things. Does he do that? A lot of things are low and sensual. Gossiping, irritation, pride. If Satan is pulling your mind down to his level, she says, bring it, the mind, back again and place it on eternal things. Okay. There is one thing that God is not going to do for you in the battle against temptation. You're going to have to do it all by yourself. It's called choosing what you think about. God will not do that for you. Now, He'll empower you. He will give you incentives, but He will not choose what you think about. It's called free choice. Christ bought it at Calvary. He will not push a button in your brain to make you a robot or a computer. You will have to make the choice. Do I want to think about this low and sensual thing, or do I want to think about eternal things? All right, let's say you make the choice. I want to think on eternal things, not on the low and the sensual. How can you do that? I'm going to give you three suggestions this morning. The first one goes like this. When I am thinking, or my mind is being pulled to think about, something that I know is not in harmony with God's will, and it is very attractive to me, it's very enticing, as we read the statement in James 1, and I'm drawn that way, a strange, strange thing happens up here in my head. Somehow, I just don't feel like getting on my knees and praying right at that moment. Why? Because I know good and well that if I drop to my knees and pray right at that moment, that enticing thought is going to disappear, and I don't really want it to. We're strange, aren't we? We say, I want, but I don't want. The good that I would, I do not. We have this little dilemma going on in our heads all the time. Our hearts and our minds are working in opposite directions. So the first way of escape, the first way to get our minds on eternal things is prayer. But folks, it's not ambulance prayer. Lord, I'm going down, I'm going down. It is preventive prayer. Just like in health, preventive is better than restorative. Preventive prayer and it's very important that you follow this procedure if you want to have victory over sin. Preventive prayer is before the temptation ever comes to you. When you're just cruising along on, 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 a, on a good walk with the Lord, that's when you pray a preventive prayer. Preventive prayer goes like this. Lord, I have this problem. There is something in my life that drags me down regularly. It makes me feel like a hypocrite. I don't know if I can ever gain the victory over this sin in my life. It seems impossible. Every time I try, I fall flat on my face. And folks, don't name ten sins before the Lord. We can't handle that many at one time. Just name the one sin that is the most destructive in your life at this moment. The one sin that is dragging you down on a regular basis. And it's going to be different for all of us. Name that sin before the Lord. Be specific, not general. I have this problem with. Name it before the Lord and be specific. And if you have to, write it down on a piece of paper and put it in your Bible. Get specific and say this to the Lord. I have this problem with. I have been totally unable to get the victory over it. Lord, I am willing. And that's the first point that you have to be is willing. If you're not quite willing, you have to pray another prayer ahead of that. Lord, make me willing to be willing. You have to be willing. You, I'm not saying you have to have the ability. You have to be willing. An alcoholic has to be willing to leave alcohol before anything can be done for that person. Be willing. I am willing to let this sin go out of my life forever. Oh, I know it's going to hurt because I want this sin, but I don't want it. I am willing to let it go. Lord, I'm going to put this sin on the altar. And if there is any way you can remove this plague spot out of my character, I give you permission to do it. That's preventive prayer. Be specific. 
name it before the Lord, place it on the altar, say, Lord, this sin is yours to take from me. I give you permission. And then the second part of preventive prayer is be persistent. Don't pray at once. This is one of those prayers that you have to be like Daniel at least three times a day, maybe more. Pray this prayer regularly. This is not vain repetition. This is persistence in prayer. Pray it regularly, every day, as soon as you wake up in the morning, before you eat lunch, in the evening, before you go to bed. Pray it again. Be serious about this plague spot in your character. As I say, not five or six, just one. The Lord is patient with us. Name that sin before the Lord, pray that prayer persistently, and you watch what is going to happen in your life. You just watch what God can do. That's the first way of getting your mind on eternal things when the devil is pulling it down to his level, is specific prayer. Second way to get your mind on eternal things. It's called memorizing Scripture. Memorizing Scripture. Oh, we don't do enough of it. Folks, the, this is the most powerful weapon against temptation that God ever devised because the Word of God contains the power of God. If you have a hard time memorizing, memorize the easy text. That's all the Word of God. It's simple. It's not rocket science. It's simple. If you've memorized ten verses of Scripture, and the moment a very attractive temptation comes into your head, at that moment without even spending any time thinking about it, you just start repeating the words of Scripture that you've memorized, those ten verses. You've got three or four minutes of time on eternal things and away from the low and the sensual that Satan is pulling your mind to. It's that simple. Twenty verses of Scripture, ten minutes. A chapter of Scripture, two chapters of Scripture, fifteen, twenty, thirty minutes. Because your mind is concentrating on those words of Scripture, not on the temptation that's so attractive. It's that simple and that basic. The more scripture you have memorized, the more time you will have on eternal things and away from the low and the sensual. Third method of getting your mind on eternal things, it's called singing. It works. It's powerful. Even easier to memorize than scripture. And the moment a temptation comes to you, you just break out in song. Say you're a monotone. God loves monotones. You just sing before the Lord. So I've found at least three ways, you may think of more, of getting our minds off of the temptations of Satan and onto eternal things. Prayer, memorizing of Scripture, and singing. Now, having said all of that, we haven't even come close to victory over sin yet. All we've done is laid a foundation. We've gotten our minds on eternal things. She continues in this little statement, and I'll give you the reference in a moment. She says, When the Lord sees the determined effort made to retain only pure thoughts. See, what the Lord wants to know is, are you serious? Do you really want to have victory in your life? Do you really want me to take control? When the Lord sees that the, the determined effort made to retain only pure thoughts he will attract the mind like the magnet. Now we're beginning to touch into power. Satan is pulling your mind down to his level. By your placing your mind on eternal things, you have given Christ permission to take hold of your mind and pull it up to his level. So you've got a tug of war going on right now. And I hope you're fully convinced by everything you read in Scripture, that in any tug of war between Christ and Satan, who loses? Satan loses. So that's the key point. You have given Christ permission. He will attract the mind like the magnet. He will purify the thoughts. He will. Not you. He will purify the thoughts. I've come across people with a very strong willpower. The doctor has scared them with a prognosis. If they keep on smoking, they're going to die very soon. They take that pack of cigarettes, they throw it into the garbage, and don't touch another cigarette for the rest of their life. You just try that with impatience and irritation. 
you just try it. I will never be impatient again, I promise. And you see how far you're going to get. If there's any hope in the temptations of the Spirit, which are way bigger than the temptations of the flesh, it's going to be a miracle of God purifying our thoughts. How is He going to do that? Why is it that when some very insulting words come into our ears that are really demeaning and someone is standing right in our face, that without even thinking about it, suddenly our face turns a different color than it was before? Why is that? Well, it's very simple. Those auditory signals come into our ears. The brain processes it quickly. And the brain says to the organs of the body, and the skin is the biggest organ of the body, blood vessels get to the surface quickly. It's time for fight or flight. And your face turns a slightly different color than it was before. Wouldn't it be a miracle of God if when those same words come into your ears without even your taking time to process it, a smile comes to your face? as you hear those same exact words. Because God has rerouted your brain pathways. He has shut down the old ones, which is, I can't take that, I'm going to defend myself now, into, I'm sorry your, your attitude is that way, I love you. All by a miracle of purifying the thoughts. Purifying the thoughts. God has ways. God has ways. She adds, after he has purified our thoughts, he will enable them to cleanse themselves from every secret sin. Every secret sin. If you give God permission, he can come into your mind, and he can reroute your brain pathways, and he can give you victories you never dreamed of before in your life. Impossible dream victories and you can have the experience of Jesus Christ during his life on earth. So there are ways. There are ways of getting your mind on eternal things. That's just the first step. That's the part we have to play. And then we give God permission to do what we can't do, and that is change our thoughts, purify them, make them holy instead of selfish. Now she doesn't stop there. She says, the first work, of those who would reform is to purify the imagination. Oh my, she really touched close now. You know, we uh, look good in church and at camp meeting, but that's not where we really live, is it? Where we really live is right here, in our secret world of our imagination, where nobody else can see in, nobody else can say you should or shouldn't. I know you're aware that there are some things that uh, we do or don't do, let's put it that way, some things we don't do because there are penalties attached to them if we do them. Let's say you're uh, traveling down a road uh, that is clearly marked at 35 miles per hour and you don't want to be bothered, you're traveling at 55 miles per hour. Why is the most interesting thing on your vehicle at that moment the rear view mirror? <laughs> because you're a law-abiding citizen or because your only motivation for obeying the law is avoiding a $200, $300 ticket? Okay. When you get home, you made it without a ticket. You park your car in the garage, you go into your house, and in your easy chair, you settle down, and right up here in your imagination, you get into the hottest Ferrari ever built, you drive all over town at 50 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour, 100 miles an hour, you dodge all the traffic, you don't worry about stoplights, cops come after you and they crash into each other just like in the video games. You're having the time of your life, and no policeman can give you a ticket. Up here in your head, you can do anything you want. I don't think I have to spell that out anymore, do I? I think you have the picture very clear. Up here in your mind is where you live without any restrictions whatsoever. You can do whatever you want, and folks, 99.9% .9 of sin takes place in the imagination. In the imagination. That's the plague spot 
of our lives. And Ellen White says the first work of those who would reform is to purify your imagination. Now what do you think? Are you going to be able to do that? Are you going to be able to purify your imagination? I haven't read too many self-help books that will accomplish that. She says, when tempted to yield to a corrupt imagination, then flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. You flee when tempted. When that thought comes into your mind and you know the road it's going to take you down, then you flee to the throne of grace. How do you do that? Prayer, Bible memorization, singing. You flee to the throne of grace and you pray for strength from heaven. And she concludes, in the strength of God, the imagination can be disciplined to dwell upon things which are pure and heavenly. In the strength of God. We are talking about miracles, my friends. If we're going to talk about the way of escape for every temptation, we're talking about a miracle of God. We have to take the first step. We have to choose to place our mind on His side. And then he takes hold of whatever weakness and sin and temptation that we are faced with, and he will turn it into victory. It's a miracle of God. Victory over sin is a miracle of God. Let's pray for it. Let's seek for it. Let's not be content with, oh, well, I fell again. I'm sorry, Lord. Let's move away from that mindset of sinning and repenting and sinning and repenting over and over on the same thing. The reference for this, and I encourage you to look it up for yourself, is the little compilation called Mind, Character, and Personality, MCP, Mind, Character, and Personality, Volume 2, page 595. All right, back to our little search through the Bible. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that's what I was spending my time on there. Let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Now, folks, in the next three texts we're going to read, we are moving into some of the most impossible promises in the Bible that God ever gave that seem absolutely beyond reason or reasonability. How could he say what we're going to read? 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Does that sound reasonable for people like you and me with fallen natures? Totally unreasonable. Every thought all the time, 100% of the time, our imagination pure all the time. How can that possibly be? Uh, Pastor O has been uh, asking a question of you uh, in the past few days, and I think he'll ask it again. Do you believe the Bible? And I'm going to ask you that question right now, and I'm going to ask you to really mean it when you say it. Sure, it's easy to believe the easy promises of the Bible. God loved the world so much that he sent his only begotten son. That's easy. But this one, do you really believe the Bible? Or do you readjust the Bible to make it reasonable? for your fallen nature. This one says, every thought in captivity to the obedience of Christ. Let's go back to that little diagram that we uh, had on before. First of all, let's ask the question, what do you think? Was every thought of Jesus Christ in captivity to his heavenly Father? See how easy that question was to answer? You just answered it automatically. What was the result for 33 years in Christ's life? No sin, no sin. Now, that is not talking about Christ in this text. It's talking about us after the new birth. And it says that same thing can happen to us. It doesn't say every thought will be removed. It says every thought can be brought into captivity. When the thought comes into your head unbidden, you can place it in captivity and saying, Lord, I can't deal with this thought. I give it to you. Take control of it. This is a promise that we have to believe or else we don't believe the Bible. Next text, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, 16.
This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All right, let's be very sure we understand the terms again. Make sure we know what we're reading. The lust of the flesh, according to James 1.14, is not sin, it is temptation to sin, drawn by our own lust and enticed. But fulfill the lust of the flesh, that's sin. All right, let's reread it. Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not sin. That's what the text says. Do you believe the Bible? You say, I've been walking in the Spirit for a long time, and I still sin now and then. It's not the same as it used to be, but occasionally I still slip and fall. This text can't mean what it says. This text should mean, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not sin so often. That's what the text really should say. We criticize scholars for reinterpreting the Word of God, don't we? Making it say something else than it plainly says. In the beginning, God created the earth in six literal days. And they say, no, that has to be six long periods of time. Well, are we reinterpreting this Word of God? Walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not. It doesn't say must not. It doesn't say should not. It says shall not sin. Was Christ walking in the Spirit? Could he sin while he was walking in the Spirit, my friends? Does the Holy Spirit sin? He doesn't sin in heaven. He doesn't sin in Christ. He doesn't sin in you and me. You know, the only way you can sin against God, and I don't care what the sin is, the only way you can sin against God is to say, Holy Spirit, would you step over there for a few minutes? I'm going to do something now that you can't participate in. I'll get back to you when I'm done. That's the only way we can sin, because the Holy Spirit will not participate in our outburst of temper, my friends. The Holy Spirit does not sin in us. And my friends, we walk intermittently in the Holy Spirit. That's our problem. Jesus walked constantly in the Holy Spirit. And this promise of the Bible says we can walk in the Spirit. Do you believe the Bible? The toughest text of all is 1 John chapter 3. <clears throat> now the whole section says virtually the same thing, so we'll just pick out two or three verses here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Verse 8, he that committeth sin is of the devil. Verse 9, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed, that's God's seed, remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Do you believe the Bible? He cannot sin because he is born of God. Now this text is so unbelievable, so beyond even reasonable comprehension, that here is how we are being told we should understand this verse to make it reasonable. The, verse, the, the verbs are in the present tense. So here is how we should read them. Verse 6, Whosoever is abiding in him is not sinning habitually. Verse 8, He that is habitually sinning is of the devil. That makes it more reasonable, doesn't it? If I'm habitually doing the same thing over and over and over, then I'm letting the devil run me. But if it's only occasional, if I slip now and then, I'm, of, uh, I'm walking in Christ. It's good. I'm saved. So now I need your help. If that is, and that is what we're being told, is the correct interpretation of this passage. If that is correct, then I'm going to need your help. Three losses of temper per week. Habitual or occasional? Oh, habitual. Two, habitual or occasional? One, now be careful now, one loss of temper per week, is it habitual or just a slip now and then? One every three weeks, how about that one? Do you see where we're going with this? We're counting up how many sins we can commit and still be in a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it leads to. Folks, it's in the present tense, in Greek, 
It, the present tense in English is exactly the same. It means this moment of time in which I am living, not five minutes past, that's past tense, not five minutes future, that's future tense. So let's reread this text that we have just looked at, 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. Whosoever is abiding in him presently, right at the moment, is presently not sinning. Verse 8, he that is presently committing sin is presently of the devil. Not talking about past or future, just at that moment. Because if you are sinning, the devil is running your life at that moment. If you are obedient, the Holy Spirit is running your life at that moment. We are intermittent Christians. That's our problem. We are not consistent Christians. And it says in verse 9, remember, he cannot sin because he is born of God. When Jesus Christ was abiding in the Holy Spirit, he couldn't sin. And when we are abiding in the Spirit, we can't sin. It's impossible. So here we have some very, very difficult Bible texts to believe. And again, that question needs to be asked over and over in our lives. Do we really believe the Bible? Do we really believe the impossible texts of the Bible? Do we take them at face value, or do we reinterpret them to fit our own experience? Most theology is experience-driven, not biblically driven. That's how many, many errors have come into the Christian church. This is my experience. This is what everyone is going through. We're all in the same boat, so this is how salvation must work. And that is no different than reinterpreting the first chapters of Genesis to make them into an evolutionary scheme. There's no difference. Do we believe the Bible as it is written? All right, I hope that you've been able to uh, grasp the importance of that question. Does the Bible teach character perfection? Does it teach sinless character? But let's look at a couple of the spirit of prophecy statements. I'm not going to read very many. There's a whole sheaf of statements in here for you to read, but I'm going to pick out two or three. The fourth paragraph on the first page of Ellen White's statements. Desire of Ages 123. Not even by a thought did he yield a temptation. So it may be with us. Not even by a thought. What a promise. What a promise. Down about two-thirds of the way down the page. IHP, In Heavenly Places, page 146. It's a long paragraph. The last sentence in that long paragraph. Last sentence. Everyone, and the key point now is to notice the words, everyone who by faith obeys God's commandments will, not must, should, will reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression. Everyone, that means everyone here, everyone who believes in Jesus Christ as their Savior will reach that condition of sinlessness. Oh, we are so afraid of that word sinless. We are dead sure it's fanaticism, and yet the prophet of God uses it several times to describe what God can do in his people. Turn to page 2, Ellen White Statements, page 2. Second paragraph on page 2. Review and Herald, April 1, 1902. In the middle of that paragraph, after the ellipsis, he came to this world and lived a sinless life, that in his power his people might also live lives of sinlessness. Oh, I've heard it so many times. Jesus came to this world to die on the cross as our sacrifice for sins. End of discussion. If that's true, why didn't God just plant him like he did Adam at full maturity, age 30, give him three and a half years to teach, and then he died? And that's the way the, the incarnation would work. He died for our sins. Why did he put him on earth as a little baby, uh, uh, growing up from babyhood to adulthood, 30 years before he even began his mission, unless it's what we have just read? He came to this world and lived a sinless life, that in his power, his people might also live lives of sinlessness. It's more than his death for our sins. It is his life for our victory. About to halfway down the page, God's Amazing Grace, page 230. 
Our Savior does not require impossibilities of any soul. He expects nothing of His disciples that He is not willing to give them grace and strength to perform. Watch the words here. He would not call upon them to be perfect if He had not at His command every perfection of grace to bestow on the ones upon whom He would confer so high and holy a privilege. Did you read demands, commands, musts, shoulds there? Not a one. All gifts of grace, privileges, bestowing, conferring. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about what God can give us. You see, we have two fists. And God says, now I have gifts that I want to give you. Will you open up your fist and let me pour in my forgiving grace? And we say, yes, I want it very much. Pour all, my, all your grace into my hand and forgive me and treat me as if I had never sinned. And he does. And then God says, now you have another fist and I have another gift. Will you open up your other fist and let me pour in some more grace? But this grace will do a different work. It's called overcoming grace. And we look at these two gifts of grace, forgiving grace and overcoming grace. And this one requires lifestyle changes. This one means I change my activities, my, my food choices, my viewing habits, my entertainment. And we say, hmm, I think I like this gift best. Forgiveness is great. And you, the whole Christian world, my friends, has turned the gospel into forgiveness alone. And Adventism is doing the same thing. Forgiveness is the best gift of God's grace, we are being told. But of the two gifts, which is really the better gift? I think you know. You know how we can be absolutely sure that this gift of overcoming grace is the best gift of God's grace and the true heart of the gospel? Is because very soon, if what we've been hearing for the last couple of days is at all right, and I think it is, this beautiful gift of forgiving grace will be taken away, never to be seen again for the rest of the universe history. Why? Because God is going to rip away gifts that we need? He never does that. He always supplies our needs. The only reason He will take away forgiving grace is because when this work of overcoming grace has so dominated and controlled and permeated us, this gift, this beautiful gift of forgiving grace will never be needed again. And He'll say, I'll move on to other business. We will close probation. I will step out of the heavenly sanctuary, and then I'll come back to this earth rather quickly. So very soon, you may be in the situation of the best gift of God's grace without the need for the other one at all. Overcoming grace, the best gift that God has to offer us. Turn to page 3. Uh, how about the third paragraph on page 3? Review and Herald, March 10, 1904. He who has not sufficient faith in Christ to believe that he can keep him from sinning has not the faith that will give him an entrance into the kingdom of God. See, that believing the Bible is pretty important now, isn't it? He who doesn't have faith to believe these promises does not have the faith that will allow him entrance into heaven because righteousness is by faith, by faith in the promises of God, the impossible ones as well as the easy ones. Do we believe them even if we don't see them happening in the people around us, in the church, or in our own lives, even if we don't believe with our own eyes what, what, we, what we're seeing? Do we believe God? That's what it was about with Jesus on the cross. Hope did not present to him as coming forth from the grave a conqueror, but faith said, my father promised. And Jesus had to exercise faith in contrast to reason and evidence and logic and history and his senses. Faith is what it's all about. Faith in Christ. The next two paragraphs talk about Enoch, and then two-thirds of the way down the page, there is a little sentence all by itself. Do you see it? And there are Enochs in this our day. Apparently, God has people who are ready for translation right now. They're Enochs. And, of course, what do we want to know? Well, who is it, Lord? Who's the Enoch? And, you know, the worst question in the world to ask is, do you know anybody who's perfect? 
Or even worse yet, are you perfect? Because this is God's business, it's not our business. We can't identify other people, we can barely get through our own problems. And so it is God's business to identify the Enoch's. Because this is not about salvation, it's about his vindication. And God needs to know. The last three paragraphs warn us that when we're in this process of character perfection, we'll not be going around claiming, I haven't sinned for three whole months. Because you've just sinned right then. Pride has taken over. Look at me, Peter says. I'm walk on water. <laughs> He's down. <laughs> Whenever we claim what it is only God's business to claim, we sin against God. Human pride takes over. So we have to be careful. People have often said, well, these three statements prove that we'll never be sinless. No, they prove that when we claim to be something that only it is God's claim to be, we are intruding upon God's territory. That's all these statements are saying. All right, we have looked at some of these statements. Now, one little problem. I have spent all my time talking to you about definition four. Let's go back and uh, check that again. Character maturity. I've spent all my time talking to you about character maturity in these texts that we have been reading. And did I not say that the only requirement for salvation was definition three, character surrender? Didn't I say that? So why have I wasted your time by talking about something that is not even a requirement for salvation? The thief on the cross wasn't mature, but he was surrendered, therefore he's saved. And I've talked to you about something that isn't even a requirement for salvation. Why did I do that? All right, look at your outline again, the one on perfection. At the bottom of the page, left-hand side, it says close of probation. We don't have time to look up those texts this morning. You can look them up for yourself. There is a time coming in which human probation will be closed. On the right-hand side of the page on the bottom, it says 144,000. And we're going to finish up our seminar this week by looking at the two most incredible texts God has ever placed in the Bible, Revelation 7 and Revelation 14. Revelation 7, as you well know, talks about four angels holding the four winds of destruction. We live in that time period right now. And then there's another angel with the seal of the living God who has a message to the four angels in verse 3. His message is, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. What is God saying? There will not be a destruction of this earth due to human activities alone. I have set my angels to protect the earth until my servants are sealed, and then I will let things loose. And you'll see destruction on this earth. So the key factor in when there will be an end to this world's history is not what's happening in Rome, not what's happening in Washington, D.C., not, what ha not is what is happening in polluting the earth so that our earth is out of balance and out of whack and there is more heat and more cold and more tornadoes or whatever it is. The key factor in when there will be an end to this world's misery is when God seals his people. That's the key ingredient. Everything else is dependent upon that. All right, so the sealing of God's people, what does that mean? Turn to Revelation 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Can't you see what the seal of God is right there? The father's name, his character, written in your mind, where you do your thinking, in your forehead, your conscience. And look at the result in verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile. Guile means hypocrisy, deceit, pretense for they are without fault before the throne of God. If you doubt what that word means, without fault, I've listed two more texts on your outline using the same word in the Greek language, and it refers to Jesus Christ. They are without fault before the throne of God. What God has promised right here 
is I will take a whole generation of sinners and by the miracle working power of the Holy Spirit, the things we've been talking about during this period, I will turn them into the wonder of the universe. A whole generation of people that have stopped rebelling against me. That nothing that Satan can do to them can touch them ever again because they will say no every single time. That's what God is promising. They will say no. And remember, this is only a promise. It's not a guarantee. God is not going to put a straitjacket around us. That's not the seal of God. All he will do is put our, his name in our forehead and say, trust me, trust me. And I promise Satan can't overcome you. That's what the seal of God is. I want you to think like Satan for just a couple of minutes. Satan is a very tenacious individual. I believe that probably his, the lowest point in his entire existence up to that time was when Jesus died on the cross and came out of the tomb on the third day. Can't you imagine that Satan said, it's all over with me, I'm done. Everything I've tried to do, 30 years, I couldn't get him to sin once. And now he's risen from the dead. But Satan, being very tenacious, says, I think I'll just hang on a little bit and see what happens. And within one generation, when the apostles passed off the scene, he had people coming his way again. He had begun to insinuate his deceptions into Christianity again. Another century went by, another century, and he had the whole Christian church under his thumb for a thousand years. He was feeling pretty good. And then along comes some reformers. Martin Luther, John Calvin, John Wesley. And I think Sa Satan was again feeling a little shaky. These men are going to change things in this world, but I'll wait. I'll wait through that generation. I'll wait for their descendants. And sure enough, he was getting the followers back into his grasp. And then along comes a special movement of prophecy. And not only a special movement, but God specially helping that movement like he hadn't helped any movement for 1,800 years with a prophetic voice direct from heaven. And I would say, yeah, I'm getting really shaky now. Things are not looking good. But the past history is on my side. I'm going to hang in there. And within a generation or two, that movement of prophecy was coming back under his control. I think Satan is being pretty good because he has all the evidence on his side. What movement that God has ever called into existence has fulfilled the purpose that God called it into existence for? There isn't any. Somewhere down the line, there was a failure. And God had to start another movement. God had to start another movement. And if I were Satan, I'd say, I'm going to be saying, all the history is with me. I'm going to take this one down too. This remnant church of prophecy, they are not going to beat me. Not now. Bring it on, Lord. Let's have the time of trouble. Because all Satan has to do to prove that God is a liar and his promises can't be trusted is to get one of those sealed ones to sin one time. Was there a major risk in the great controversy when Jesus Christ came down to this earth? How many sins? One sin and God loses the great controversy? And now God has multiplied that risk by 144,000. And he says, I promise, and I will step out of the sanctuary so there are no underhand games going on. I promise that all of these sinners will never sin again for the rest of eternity. You talk about a risk that God is taking in saying that group of people will be 144,000 Jobs on this earth. And they will be faithful no matter what happens. In fact, I want to take you to one more Ellen White statement. It's on the first page of the Ellen White statements. The first page of the Ellen White statements. Halfway down the first page. Desire of Ages 671. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. 
The honor of God, the honor of Christ, is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. The honor of God is at stake. The credibility of God. God's rulership is at stake. God's vindication is at stake. Can he perfect his people? The ultimate miracle of all, all 6,000 years of human history is going to be performed in these people. Enough about Satan. I believe God is going to win the great controversy. But folks, that has a price tag connected with it. And here's the price tag. God can't, won't, shouldn't win the great controversy while his people do not have his seal. It's not going to happen. And the only way he can end it is if his people are sealable. If they have characters that can be sealed. Because he can't win without that. Revelation 7 and 14 will never happen without the seal of God being fixed in the forehead, in the conscience, in the mind, as a promise that there will never again be rebellion against God in thought, word, or action. And so God is going to have to wait until he finds that sealable people. He has waited a long time in the Seventh-day Adventist church, my friends. He wanted to do it in my great-grandfather's generation in Minneapolis in 1888. He was a delegate to that council. He wanted to do it in my parents' generation. He's wanting to do it in my generation, folks, and your generation. It all depends on which generation will allow him to do it. That's when Jesus will come. Which generation will be the one in which God can say, I trust them, they're going forward to victory now. We can end the great controversy. That's what the price tag is. So the only question left for us to decide is, will we be that generation? Not will it happen, not will God win, but will we be the generation through whom he can do his final work? So I'm going to ask you to do something as you leave this uh, camp meeting, as you go back to your activities. Don't just go back and continue business as usual, folks. Don't do it. Uh, we're going to go to our graves if we do that, every one of us. We're going to have to get really, really serious about our calling and our mission as Seventh-day Adventists. Yes. We are the key. We, believe it or not, are the key to the timing of the coming of Jesus Christ. And so, my friends, do some wrestling with God. Ellen White says, wrestling with God, how few know what it is. Do some wrestling with God over those plague spots in your character that are not sealable at the present time. Wrestle with God. Plead with him for a miracle. Reroute brain pathways. Ask him to do that. So that sin will become as hateful to you as it was for Jesus Christ, we're told it can be. We will hate sin just as Jesus Christ hated sin. That's a miracle of God. When it is no longer attractive, it is no longer, we're not drawn to it anymore because he has stepped in and rerouted our thinking process. So let's ask God for the ultimate miracle that he has ever performed. Not for our salvation, but for his vindication. You see, all this that I'm talking about is based on character maturity. Remember again, that's a particular slide. Character maturity. Martin Luther could not vindicate God. He had too many flaws in his theology. It was not a sound theology in many ways. He could not vindicate God, but I expect to see him in heaven. His surrender was there, but his knowledge was lacking in some key areas. And so this last generation is not called upon to save themselves, but to vindicate God. Salvation is a byproduct of that. And so our focus needs to be on vindication of God, character maturity, to bring about the second coming of Christ. Salvation, praise God. Surrender, yes, will bring salvation. But surrender alone will not bring the second coming of Christ until maturity enters the picture. So let's be, my friends, let's be Seventh-day Adventists. And let's pray for that day to come soon in which God can say, they're ready. Here is the patience of the saints. Not here will be. Here are they that actually are keeping my commandments, not want to, should, or, want, or, or plan to. And they, these are ready to walk with me in white. Let's pray for that. Let's kneel in prayer as we close this, please. 
Father in heaven, we have tarried on this earth so many years because of Laodiceanism, sleepiness, lethargy, self-confidence, pride, self-righteousness, so many things have kept us here. But right now, Lord, I am praying for a miracle. I am praying for everyone who names the name of Jesus Christ as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian to be praying for the seal of God. I am praying that this will become a reality throughout the, net, the length and breadth of the, la of the land, and that this group here, as we go back to our churches, may be shining lights of what it means to end this world's history. So, Lord, take us weak, helpless, reroute brain pathways, do whatever is necessary, Lord. Make sin hateful to us. Make it so ugly we don't want to touch the stuff again. So, Lord, I pray, I pray that you can do by your power what will vindicate your name. We want to be vessels. We want to be channels by which you can do that. So, Lord, take us. Make us that group of people that for all eternity will be the wonder of the universe. A people who have lived on earth without a mediator to forgive their sins for a short period of time and then have walked directly into heaven without seeing death. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.